again this morning. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. For a lot of us, that can feel really hard to believe that where He is, where His Spirit is, that we are truly free. But Jesus has entered the picture. He's a part of our story. He's changed our destiny forever. And now we are a people who are set free, whose chains are breaking, whose hearts are waking up to the presence of God. And wherever you are today watching this, the presence of the Lord is near to you. Scripture says that you could reach out and touch him. He isn't far from us. This king who's attentive to your needs, who knows your heart today, he's close by. And in that perfect eternal presence, there is a hope for you. There's a freedom for you. Where the spirit of the Lord is there, is freedom. Chains are breaking, hearts are recognize that God is a living, personal presence, not a piece of chiseled stone. And when God is personally present, a living spirit, the old constricting legislation is recognized as being obsolete. We are free of it today. Free of the law today, all of us. And there's nothing between us and God. Our face is shining with the brightness of his face. And so we are transfigured much like the Messiah, our lives gradually becoming brighter and more beautiful as God enters our lives and we become like him. God, that's what we're asking you for this morning. As we sing these words, that you would remind us that the veil is torn, that when we look to you, search for you, we find you, presence is with us. God, that you're not, you're not an idol carved of stone, but you are the personal and present Messiah. Jesus, for anyone who needs reminding this morning that you, that you are personal, that you are close, would you remind hearts, would hearts come awake to you today? For any one of us who feels distant from your presence, would you remind us that you are near, that you never left. You're the king who is coming close, and for that we say thank you, thank you, Jesus. Remind us as we sing today of our need for you, and of your power and ability to meet us.
still in your presence all the noise dies down lord speak to me now you have all my attention i will linger and listen oh i can't miss a thing and lord i know my heart wants more of you my heart wants something
Father, of all the loves in our life, God, we know that no other love satisfies the way that you do. And yet, God, and yet we consistently go after things that are empty, after things that demand that we serve them in order to be loved by them. But God, you're not like that. You're not like that. You served before anyone served you. You came after us before we ever came after you. And so God, we need you to teach our hearts that are used to worshiping idols who tell us to serve them or else to know what it's like to be loved by you. When you look at your people, you look at me and it's your love that motivates you. It's not our worthiness, it's not our record, it's not our discipline, but it's you. So God, before we open your word, before we study what you have to say, God, would you get our hearts ready to have a posture that says, God, speak to me. Speak to me. I don't wanna live on old bread. I don't wanna live on old stories. God, I want you to speak afresh to me and to us. Because God, without your word, we have no hope. We have no life. So God, do what only you can and speak. We pray this in Christ's mighty name. Amen. It's good to be with you guys today. Uh, my name is Tyler. I'm one of the pastors here at the Austin Stone and I lead our downtown congregation. If you have a Bible, you can open up to the uh, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17. That's where we're going to be the majority of the time uh, together. But before we get into the sermon, here's what I wanted to do. I wanted just to take a moment to celebrate to celebrate what God has done through this church and to let you know of ongoing needs in this church. So the, the, the storm that happened obviously devastated so many in our city and our surrounding areas. And it was incredible to see the ways people like you and our church rallied so quickly in order to love our city. Because we know, we know God's love, that if we truly understand God's love, we won't love other people just in word, but in deed. So I wanna give you a couple of really cool stats that just kind of capture what God has done and to give you some ways to serve in the future. We were able to serve almost 5,000 people, almost 5,000 people through our church. We gave over around 17,000 gallons of water. We were able to give through our church alone, men, women, even children were carrying water. We wanted to serve our city. We were able to give 7,000 volunteer hours just through our church. And I could tell you so many more stats, but all those numbers, they capture individuals. They capture connection between image bearers who are in desperate need. And, and we know just because you're okay doesn't mean our city is okay. And we wanna be a church that blesses this city. And so we wanna give you opportunities on ways to showcase neighbor love. Because neighbor love means we don't go on the other side of the road to not see the needs of our city. To love our neighbor means we go to where the needs are and have our lives interrupted to serve other people. So there's so many ways, there's so much, there's so much more need in our city. So go to austinstone.org slash this week and find one way you can serve and one way to donate because we want this city to be blessed because of our presence in it. So just one quick announcement I wanted to share with you, encourage you. I love our church and there's still more work yet to be done. Let's go ahead and jump into the, to the gospel of Matthew and to our sermon today. I love, I love working through books of the Bible, verse by verse. Here's why. Because you're always going to come to text you normally would not have studied or, or chosen to preach on. I mean, we're, we're in that, a section today, and, and I can't wait to look at it together because it's a story that's actually unique. It's unique to Matthew's gospel. It, it's not in any other gospel. It's only in Matthew's gospel. So let's read it together. Matthew 17 verse 24 through 27. This is the word of God. It says, when they came to Capernaum, 
those who collected the temple tax approached Peter and said, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he said. When he went into the house, Jesus spoke to him first. What do you think, Simon? From whom do earthly kings collect tariffs or taxes? From their sons or from strangers? From strangers, he said. Then the sons are free, Jesus told him. But so we won't offend them, go to the sea and cast in a fish hook and take the first fish that you catch. When you open its mouth, you'll find a coin. Take it and give it to them for me and you. Now, when you first read this story, honestly, it's a little confusing, but I wanna show you two points from the text today. Here's our two points. First point, Jesus is the temple to end all temples. And secondly, Jesus meets people where they are. Okay, first point, Jesus is the temple to end all temples. Look back at verse 24. It says, when they came to Capernaum, those who collected the temple tax approached Peter and said, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? So Jesus and his disciples, they've come to a familiar city in Capernaum. They've done a lot of ministry there already. And so they're probably pretty familiar to the people of this lakeside town. So they come to Peter, they ask him about Jesus, his rabbi. They ask if he pays the temple tax. Now it's really important to distinguish this tax from others. So listen, this is not a tax from the Roman government. And it's not a tax of some form of corruption from the religious leaders to prop up their own power. I say both of those because Jesus later on, he's gonna deal with taxes from the government and the Roman government particularly. And he's gonna deal with corrupt Jewish leaders. But that's not this text. This text and this tax is clearly aligned with what God had commanded Israel in the Old Testament. If, if you look back in Exodus 30 and in Nehemiah 12, what you see is God commanding the people of God to pay half a shekel or in our case, two drachma in this context towards the upkeep of the temple. So this is the tax from God. And the temple is incredibly important and prominent throughout the Old Testament because it has to do with God's presence among his people. So the question they're asking is massive. It seems small at first, but it's massive because of the prominence of the temple. And look at how Peter responds. Can't you, can't you just imagine the way Peter answers this confidently with no real idea whether he's right or not? If you look back at verse 24, look at it with me. He says, when they came to Capernaum, those who collected the temple tax approached Peter and said, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? I love Peter. Yes, of course, obviously he does. And then he walks into the house and says, Jesus spoke to him first. Before Peter can even ask him, he says, what do you think, Simon? And notice Jesus calls him Simon, not Peter, because he knows him who he was. He says, from whom do earthly kings collect tariffs or taxes, from their sons or from strangers? Peter says, from strangers. And he said, then the sons are free. Peter says, of course he pays the tax. And as soon as he walks into the house, Jesus asks him about it. And, and maybe Jesus knew about the conversation from some sort of secret knowledge he had, but probably he overheard the conversation. And as soon as Peter walks in, it's a question, an indirect question about kings and taxes, which can we just have some sympathy for these disciples? Like their interactions with Jesus, they, they are most likely, listen, they're most likely in their late teens and early 20s. And every single time Jesus asks them a question, I bet they're all just thinking, please don't direct it at me. Because they're almost all, and it's, and it's indirect. It's, it's not even about the question about temple tax. He talks to them about kings and taxing of their own children. Jesus asks them, he says, do kings tax their own family or do they tax people outside of their family? Well, the answer is meant to be obvious because to tax their children would be to tax themselves. That's the idea. Why would they tax themselves? It's their own wealth and financial possessions. Jesus says, exactly, Peter, exactly. The sons of the king are free from any tax, and this applies to the temple. Jesus is saying very clearly, I'm not obligated to pay this tax because I'm the son of the one who dwells in the temple. That's what he's saying. And the significance of this statement is not just about his identity as the son of God, though it is, it's specifically how he relates to the temple. 
Now again, it's difficult for us to understand the gravity and the significance of the temple in the Old Testament and in Jewish life in general, because that's not most of our experience. See, the temple, it's this theme, it's this motif in the Bible from beginning to end because it deals with the presence of God. So God's temple, his temple in a sense began in Eden. Eden was God's first temple because what happened there? He dwelled with his image bearers. And what did he tell them to do? He gave them the commission of go make the entire planet like what? Like Eden. Go make it where my image and my presence fills the entire planet. But when we sinned against him, when we were deceived and we distrusted and we devalued God and our sin, what did he do? He cast us out of his presence. And where was his presence uniquely? Eden. He cast us out. But his casting us out didn't mean he never wanted us to be brought back in. So what does God do? The story of the Bible. He seeks out Abraham and he seeks out Israel to do what? To dwell among them to bless all the peoples of the earth. So what happens? He dwells with Israel in the tabernacle and he travels with them in the tabernacle as they journey from captivity to the promised land. And then from tabernacle, they build the temple and not because the temple could house all of God, he's infinite, but because it would be almost like a new Eden. It would be where God dwelled and ruled and reigned from Israel to bless the nations. You see in the scriptures, the Old Testament, his presence goes from Eden to tabernacle to temple. The temple was the sign of God's presence and God's blessing. That's why the temple, if you read the Old Testament, it's so prominent in God's judgment on Israel. Israel keeps rebelling against him and his judgment is often seen in his reaction towards his own temple. So in Ezekiel 10, when God's glory leaves Israel, you know what it, where he leaves? The temple. In Jeremiah, when Israel is exiled for its sin, what do they destroy? The temple. It's a confirmation of God's judgment. The, the temple was central to the Jewish understanding of God's plan for the world. Um, N.T. Wright, he's a New Testament scholar, he talks about the centrality of the temple in Jewish thought. Here's what he says. But the temple remained central geographically and symbolically. It was the place where heaven and earth met, thus forming the signpost to the ultimate promise, the renewal and unity of heaven and earth, the new creation in which the one God would be personally present forever. Okay, why do I tell you all this? Why spend all this time talking about this motif of the temple? Here's why. I want you to understand what Jesus is saying when he says the sons are free when it comes to the temple tax. Jesus is not undermining the temple. Okay, he's not saying it's not important. He's not saying it's not prominent. Here's what he's saying. Something greater than the temple is here. He already said it in Matthew 12, 6. Jesus says, I tell you something greater than the temple is here. God is no longer dwelling in a physical temple. He's dwelling in the person of Jesus. That's the claim, that Jesus is now the new temple to end all temples, John 1, 14. And the word of God became flesh and what? Dwelt, tabernacled among us. He's the new temple and we have seen his glory Glories of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Colossians 1.19, notice the dwelling language. For in him, Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. See, Christians, we're this strange bunch. We are a templeless people. We're a templeless people. Our physical temple is Jesus. And then in Ephesians 2, we're told that Jesus is actually taking himself as the temple and now taking the church and building a new spiritual home for himself where we're known by our love and unity and truth. Now, this was beyond strange to the Jews and the entire Roman world because every God had a temple. And it's still strange to this day. All major world religions have temples and holy sites where God or some spiritual reality is more potent there than in other places. You you, you go to certain places to experience the grandeur of the holy because it's more here than it is over there. 
But that's not only true of other religions, it's true of everybody, of everybody. Like even those people who could never imagine, like so many of our friends in our city, even if you're listening to this, you're not a Christian, I'm glad you're listening to it. But so many of our friends who don't have any real faith, they, can't, they can never imagine themselves walking into a temple or going to a, f- a physical shrine and worshiping. But listen to me, what do temples do? What do they do? They house the deity. They house the deity. They, temples have this special power and significance because what? They possess what we worship. And in our context, just because we don't call something a temple does not mean it doesn't function as one. Hear me again. Just because we don't call something a temple doesn't mean it doesn't function as one. Human beings can't help but worship. Like no matter what we may say in our minds, like we may say in our minds, I believe in Jesus, or we may say in our minds, like I don't believe in God. I believe in a physical universe where there's no meaning or purpose. Our minds can say something and yet we always find our hearts doing what? Clawing for meaning and clawing for significance and longing for joy and longing for beauty and longing for justice. All these things science could never give to us. We find our hearts just made for it. We find our hearts turning anything into a temple. And we find ourselves saying, if I could just give myself over to this thing, I'd finally get the joy and love and forgiveness I'm after. Let me give you an example. Work, work can become our temple where it's not just about work or a career. No, it's a means by which we worship to get an identity or significance. We're not just working at our jobs, we're worshiping saying, this tells me who I am. Family can become a temple of idolatry where we go to family not to serve and to to love others, but to tell me who I am at the deepest level, to show me what it means to be secure. My family becomes my rock and my refuge more than God. Sex can become a temple where what we worship is self-expression over everything. See, human beings can't help but turn their world into a temple because we can't help but worship. That's who we are. We find a way to do it everywhere. And so if you don't understand that about yourself, you you may think, well, I'm not singing songs or I'm not burning incense or some of you burning incense or I'm not having physical shrines. But even if you don't have the physical expression of what you would deem as worship, doesn't mean your heart doesn't long and think, if I just had that thing, I'd be happy. If I just had that relationship, if I just had that popularity, if I just had that freedom, if I just had that, oh, I'd be happy. Oh, and if I lost that, and if I didn't get this thing I wanted, then who would I be? That's worship. And these longings, this worship in us, these temples we create, what do we do? We sacrifice for them. We schedule around them. We direct our money towards them. What we end up doing is we worship with our lives in the same ways we're meant to worship God with our lives. Romans 12, 1, this is what worship is. It's not just singing. It says, therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies, your whole life, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. So we can take anything and turn it to an idol. So I'll give you an example, okay, from my own life of the way I can take a very good thing and turn it into a temple for my own idolatry. So an idol, here's what an idol is. An idol is a good thing we turn into a God thing. It's a good thing we turn into a God thing. We, we, we take these God-created and God-given gifts and we treat them as if they're God himself. So here's mine, my house, my house. So I had the great gift of buying a new house this summer. Now, do you guys know the market? You're all, you're all out there. If you're, you've moved here from California, uh, California, we're glad you're here, but you're making it hard to live here. We love you. We love you, we're glad you're here, but the, the real estate market is, in, is insane. And so I had a friend who sold me their home off market. 
may he and his family live forever. Because we never, we, we never could have actually, if it was on the market, we would have lost it for sure. So we have this new gift, this great gift. It's from God. It's a good thing. But my home can become a place where either we worship God or it can become a temple to my idols. So my house can become a temple to my idol of individualism. Where now my home is not where I express hospitality to other people, but my home is where I go from my real refuge, not God. My home becomes my temple of idolatry when actually it serves to protect my own image rather than opening it up as a haven for God's image on those who don't bear my last name and on those who don't bear my resemblance, who don't look like me. My home can become a temple where it's a shrine to my appetites, a shrine to my preferences rather than the fruits of the Holy Spirit where my habits and my routines center around my wisdom, my word, my desires, rather than God's. You see, if you just redefine what a temple is, then you see you can worship anywhere. Now, here's the point. As you assess your life and the temples you go into and the, place, the ways that you worship, Jesus is the temple to end all temples because he is the only temple where your failures and your sins are paid for by his sacrifice, not yours. Think about it with me. Every time you fail an idol, it demands a sacrifice. Every time. You fail at your job, you fail with your family, you fail yourself, you fail your society. What must happen when you recognize failure? What has to happen? Your idol says you must atone for it. You have to work harder, do more, log more hours, feel really bad, post more often, let go of desires. But if you want to keep your idol, you better atone. Payment must be made. But Jesus is the only one that when you fail him, he dies in your place. And there is no one, there is no one we have failed more often, failed more egregiously, and failed more consequentially than God himself. But in this temple, you don't atone for your own sins. Jesus does. In this temple, he's the sacrifice. See, idols, what they do, idols threaten you when you're shaky. They threaten you when you're shaky. They say, if you don't come through, if you don't measure up, if you lose this person, if you lose that thing, if this thing doesn't happen for you, then who are you? If you're not who you said you were, then you can never hope for a life in the future. Idols whisper these inaudible threats to our hearts. They motivate us with fear. But what does Jesus say to us? Jesus doesn't lead with threats. No, he leads with no matter what you do, I'll never leave you or forsake you. No matter what you do, I'll never leave you or forsake you. He says, I came for you, died for you, dwelled with you long before you ever wanted me. Jesus gave himself for you at your very worst. The version of yourself that you hate, that's the person he gave himself for so you could have God as your very best. The Jews asked Jesus this question. They were hearing him teach and it says in John 2, 18, so the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing all these things, making all these claims? Here's what Jesus said, destroy this temple, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. He becomes this temple that can do what no other temple can do. He can house the presence of God where sinful, broken, busted, weary people can come in confidently that they can be loved. That he died forsaken so we could be embraced. So here's the question you have to ask yourself. Are you coming to God's true temple of worship in Jesus or, or have you been worshiping good things more than God? See, you're gonna have to take a second to diagnose your heart. Like, I'm gonna give you questions, but it's not just for the sake of it. It's for you to diagnose your heart. It will take time, listen, it will take time to sort out what you truly worship because it's buried deep in your heart. 
Not just what is your answer to theological questions, but what do you long for? What do you love? What do you fear? It takes digging to get to these idols, but it's worth digging because idols, all they do is make you miserable because they can't be for you what you want them to be. They can't. It's my idolatry, it's your idolatry that drives us to disobey God and that always leads to flame out and failure. And also, listen, it's my idolatry and your idolatry that can cause us to obey God so long as he gives us our idols. We obey him and say, I'll obey you, but give me this thing I really want. And it's not you, God. And both of those paths of idolatry lead to the same place of frustration and despair. So here, here are these questions. These questions are not a religious test. They're for your joy. It's for your joy. Here's the questions. Think about it. For, for your own life, think about it. What do you fear losing most? What's the real answer? What does your mind drift to most often throughout the day? Your unprompted sort of, where does it drift? What do you talk about with the most passion? What deep down do you think would make your life complete and content if you just got it? What do you worry about? See, it's questions like this that'll show you what do you really worship? And the best thing about Christianity is you don't have to lie about the answer, you can be honest. Because God's word for the entire world, no matter what you believe, no matter how long you've been a Christian, his word for the world is always, it's going to be in Jesus where you're satisfied. It's going to be in Jesus where your longings are truly met. Jesus is what your family and career and sexual expression and monetary gain and social standing never could be. So listen, you want comfort? Who, who better to comfort you than the one who has suffered just like you and suffered for you? You want control? You want security? Who better to give it to you than the one who let go of it and saw his father come through on every word he promised. You want power? You want might? Who better to give it to you than the one who is risen from the dead and rules over all? You want approval? You want love? Who better to give it to you than the one who knows you more deeply than anybody and gave himself for you? I need you to hear me on this. Christian, Christian, Jesus is who your heart can't get over. Your heart can't get over him. He's who you're made for. If you've known him and experienced his goodness and his love, I'm telling you, you'll never be as happy anywhere than where you are with him. You'll never be as happy anywhere than you are with him. So come back to him. And if you're here and you're on the fence, you don't know what you believe, or you know you don't believe, can I just tell you, he's the one your heart's been looking for. Sincerely. You didn't know it. That's who you're looking for. And better yet, actually what's really happening, he's the one who's been looking for you. Because when it comes to lost sheep, he goes out and finds them. That we would be a people who have this prayer like David. Listen to David. Psalm 27, four, he says, one thing, one. Have I asked the Lord that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire where? In his temple. Jesus is the temple. He's who our hearts are after. And he's the one building this thing called the church into this spiritual house, that we would be a people, that we'd be a church known for, that we all collectively say together, wherever Jesus is, that's where I wanna be. Wherever he is. We wanna be a people who say, we've never tasted anything as good as him. Wherever he is, that's where I want to be. He's the new temple to end all temples. Second point, very quickly. Jesus meets people where they are. He's a temple to end all temples and he meets people where they are. Look at verse 27, a strange verse. It says, but so we won't offend them, so we won't offend them, go to the sea, cast in a fish hook and take the first fish that you catch. When you open its mouth, you'll find a coin. 
take it and give it to them for me and you. Now, this is a strange miracle, even by Jesus' standards. But instead of focusing on the miracle itself, look at why he did it, at why he did it. Look at right there, it's underlined. So we won't offend them. Isn't that interesting? So we won't offend them. He's telling Peter, I'm not obligated to pay temple tax because I'm the presence of God here and now. But instead of telling Peter to go out and challenge them, he says, don't challenge them. Instead, go catch a fish, open its mouth, and there's gonna be a coin in there for the perfect amount of the tax for me and for you. See, Jesus has this strange way of saying, I don't want to cause these guys to stumble and I don't want them to misinterpret what I'm saying and doing. Because he knows these collectors of the tax, they probably aren't religious leaders. They probably aren't power brokers in the society. They're just probably doing a job. Just coming to take care of what they're supposed to do. And Jesus in that moment is able to see that what they need most, listen, is not a lecture on how he's the fulfillment of the temple. No, what they needed most was a miraculous payment of the tax. So hear me, Jesus is not scared of offending people. Just read the gospels. He ain't scared, okay? But it's also not his goal either. Jesus is the suffering servant who what he does is he does what is best for you and for us, no matter what it costs him. So sometimes being a servant means speaking the truth in love to people who are caught in error and caught in sin and that may offend them. But the goal is not offense, it's service. And other times, service means he's gonna pay the tax so they don't get the wrong idea about him and stumble in their understanding of God. Hear me really clearly. Tyrants and cowards stay the same in every room that they're in. Tyrants and cowards stay the same in every room that they're in. But true servants walk into a room and to situations and are fully vested in that moment and say, what's best for these people here and now? Tyrants and cowards are already ready, no matter the room, to dominate or to cower. Servants say, what's best? Who are the people in front of me? What do they need? They come in and they look to serve. And Jesus is able to serve like nobody else because he's so secure. He doesn't feel threatened so he can serve. And the fact that Jesus and his kingdom can't be shaken is why we as a church can serve like nobody else. Because here's what it means. People are not threats for us to put down and they're not food for us to feast on our own passions of approval. No, what are people? They're image bearers. They're people with needs and wants and stories and desires and we're here to serve them in whatever is best for them in that moment and to serve them even when it costs us. So listen to me, sometimes serving people means not pushing them too far too fast. If you, <laughs> you probably don't know me personally, you have no idea how much I need to hear that, okay? I'm not saying that because that's my personality type. I'm saying that's because what the text says. Jesus is the temple of God and he still pays the tax. These guys aren't offended. He, he doesn't pay it because they're correct. They're wrong, they don't understand. But he'd rather do this because he has a longer view in mind. He does it because he's, Jesus is long suffering with us. If he wanted to crack you on your sin, he could do it every moment of every day, but he doesn't. He's long suffering and he's patient. And when it comes to the temple, he knows direct conflict is coming, but it's not in that moment. So he knows it's coming, but it's not in that moment. Now also on the flip side of this, this is not code for status quo is always good and right. Listen, Jesus is about to go into the temple and turn over some tables. He's about to go into the temple and reveal just how corrupt it had become. But listen, if the state and situation of these tax collectors affected Jesus's response, then it should do the same for us, right? So here's the principle. Where someone is must factor into how we treat them and love them. Where someone is must factor in into how we treat them and love them. It doesn't decide it, but it factors into it. 
There's, and there's so many implications of that. I'm gonna give you one verse to direct this love and we're done. James 1, 19 through 20, here's what he says. Here's your wisdom for how you love people. My dear brothers and sisters, understand this, everyone, everyone, no matter your position, no matter who you are, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for human anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. Really quickly, first, quick to listen. Let's be a church, come on. Let's be a church who are known for how we ask good and thoughtful questions in order to inform our love for other people, especially those we disagree with. So much to say on that. Second, slow to speak. Let's be a church who does not keep silent. You're supposed to speak, but we're slow because we're soaking our words in prayer and in the scriptures and in love. Third, slow to anger. Let's be a church whose anger takes time to build. We're supposed to get angry when things are dysfunctional and broken and unjust, but let's be a changer whose anger takes time and is slow. And it builds over time and it's felt deeply though. We feel it deeply when God's name and God's word and God's image is neglected and belittled. We are here to serve each other. We're here to serve the world, to meet people where they are and take them to where Jesus wants them to be, to come into the temple and to experience all of God's love for us in Jesus and then to help the world love what we love. There is a day coming when God fulfills every promise he's ever made. And that day, listen, no temple will be left because God's presence will be here to fill the entire planet with his life and his love. Revelation 21, 22, he says, and I, this is the last day, and I saw no temple in the city. We don't need one, why? For its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. Let's pray together. God, there is no one even close to Jesus. And God, we forget that again and again and we let other kingdoms and other idols be what motivate us and drive us and dictate us. And God, we don't have to be a people who hide. We don't have to be a people who cower. We can be a people who confess and say, God, I worship this more than you. God, I'm more fearful of losing their approval than I am of losing you. I'm more fearful of losing a bank account than I am of you. I'm more fearful of losing popularity than I am of you. God, I'm more fearful of losing comfort than I am of losing you. And yet God, in your temple, your people, we come with all of our sin and all of our brokenness and you meet the sacrifice, you meet the demands. So God, would you begin right now to free us with your grace and your love, would you begin to take those of us who are guilt-ridden and remind us that we're forgiven? For those of us who are just overwhelmed by shame over what we've done or what's been done to us and you would free us and cleanse us in your love. God, make us a people who are slow to speak, quick to listen, slow to anger. God, help us be your people who show this world you're the temple they're longing to go enter. You're the one they've been looking for. We pray these things in Christ's name, amen.
before you go this morning, I want to send you out with a benediction. A benediction is just a farewell blessing, and I hope this scripture is encouraging to you today. This is from Revelation. It says, I heard a voice thunder from the throne. Look, look, God has moved into the neighborhood, making his home with men and women. They are his people. He is their God, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death is gone for good. Tears gone, crying gone, pain gone, all the first order of things gone. And the enthroned continued and said, look, I am making everything new. Write it all down, each word dependable and accurate. Never again will anything be cursed. The throne of God and of the Lamb is at the center. His servants will offer God service. Worshiping, they will look on his face, their foreheads mirroring God. Never again will there be any night. No one will need lamplight or sunlight. The shining of God, the master, is all the light that anyone needs. And they will rule with him age after age after age. Amen. Austin Stone, we love you so much. Thanks for joining us this morning. Have a good week.